I was 25 years old when I reached the top of Mount Everest. Standing on top of the world, I saw my life flash before me. There and there was the accumulation of three years of training and three years on the mountain itself. Despite strong winds and frigid fingers, I never felt more alive. I descended from the mountain feeling humble with a calling to be a photographer. My girlfriend, Hui Yi, announced my summit success with a blog 3,000 miles away, and I vowed to myself that one day I will return to the sacred mountain with her and perhaps our future children. I even told Kami, my Sherpa, that when my children are old enough, I'll make sure they help him with his farm. I got married to my childhood sweetheart three years later, and up to that point, Hui Yi has barely traveled outside Singapore and Malaysia. I, however, is an avid traveler. At age 20, I backpack across Europe. I ate a baguette split between three meals each day. I slept at train stations in Paris, partied with locals under the bridge of Czech Republic, and finally, I got robbed in Spain. There is a saying, Reading 10,000 books is no match for walking 10,000 li. I can't read that much, so perhaps walking is my antidote. My wanderlust rubbed off my wife as we went to Rajasthan, India, a place we've never been before for our honeymoon, and that opened our worldview. However, a new chapter in my life came when I held my day-old daughter in my arms. I remember telling myself, she is so small and fragile, what did I do? <laughs> and two years later, when my son, little child, was born, I thought, life is over. <laughs> Part of the fear of having children was the fact that we may not be able to live ours again. Through my travels, I know the world is not an oyster. So where do we begin? When my wife and I shifted to Beijing 10 years ago, the first thing that we noticed was the tremendous pace of change within China. However, at the same time, we also meet our friends back home, as well as new Chinese friends. And what we notice is a lot of the children we see are over-pampered, over-stressed, and we worry about our own. By age two, little Chao, my daughter, she is no longer blubbers all day. We are able to have a decent two-way conversation. And up to that point, I always felt like a parenting intern, passing diapers, passing wet tissues, while my children tend to my wife for most things. I know that one cannot replace a mother. The mother, of course, is a very sacred position in the family. But as a father, I thought I could do more. And there was one thing I knew I could give little child that my wife couldn't give, an adventure. So at two years, six months old, I decided to bring little child with me on an eight-day trip to Taiwan just the two of us. And for the first time, I was her everything. Very different from the operation we go back in Beijing. Over there, we discarded our healthy diets. We ate junk food, we ate fried chicken, even the occasional lollipop. There are a few things we learned. She learned about buskers. She met these street performers with their musical instruments, playing their music, entertaining people along the street. She asked me, why are they doing what they do? I said, they do it so they can make us happy. She said, yes. And I said, and if we want to make them happy, we should give them a coin or a note. It shows our appreciation. She said, oh. And that was how she also learned about the concept of money. 
We fed baby animals, hung out with fishermen on their fishing boats, and we even cycled along the east coast of Taiwan. That was the first time she set her eyes on the open sea, and her imagination went simply wow. As a father, I shed a tear, knowing that I was able to give her an experience beyond her wildest dreams. As I cycled back to the city, little child became exhausted from the day's activities. As we cycled back, the conversation between us became silent. Suddenly, it reminded me of my own childhood, where I would take long car drives with my father, where I would sit at the back of the car, speaking to my father, until I fell asleep. Suddenly, both of us became fathers, ferrying our children to the next destination safely. This is the cycle of life. My father is a busy businessman. He sent me and my siblings to Singapore to study while he worked in Malaysia. As such, he did not spend so much time with us, and he never brought me to a playground, rarely bought me toys. And every time I come back to Malaysia from my school holidays, he would then bring me wherever he went, to his business meetings, to his business lunches, to his business dinners, even his business drinks. I, for one, was often silent, sitting in the corner, doing my stuff, playing with my own little toy. And after each session, he would actually take me aside and explain to me what he was doing in simple adult language. For most children, this may seem a bit boring, but for me, I was spending time with my dad. Therefore, I thought I could do the same for my girl, for my toddlers, to show her my world, to show her what changed her dad, therefore, Everest. When I mentioned this idea that perhaps I should bring little child towards Everest Base Camp, everyone thought I was crazy, except for my wife. So my wife said, so you better start getting her prepared. Trekking towards Everest Base Camp is considered one of the hardest treks in the world. At 5,400 meters in altitude, it is already higher than most mountains outside Himalayas. AMS, or acute mountain sickness, it's a condition that affects humans above an altitude of 2,500 meters and above. Mild symptoms include giddiness, nausea, headache. More severe symptoms include high-altitude pulmonary edema or high-altitude cerebral edema. It's when water gets into your brain. Left untreated, this could result in death and a lot of medical evacuations using helicopters or multiple manpower resulted from accidents up in the mountains. We cannot downplay the risk of such an endeavor. I consulted a few doctors, and one of the doctors I consulted is Dr. Nima, a Sherpa friend of mine who is an expedition doctor. When I asked if it's feasible to actually bring a child this young up towards Everest Base Camp, he said, should be okay. <laughs> they have less egos. So at the first onset of discomfort, they will let you know, unlike adults, who tend to mask some of their weakness. So as long as you're very observant about that, you can make a decision whether to descend the mountain quickly. And so we thought, let's get little child conditioned. We found a village north up from Beijing, which sits right beside the unrestored part of the Great Wall of China. And that's where we started training. The Great Wall of China is very undulating. There's a lot of rubble, and it's not easy, even for adults. When we first started training little Chao, she could barely walk for an hour uphill before she rested exhausted. But within a few months, we went there a few weeks on regular intervals. She was able to walk non-stop for five hours up the hills. And this is no small feat. Because after all, if we were going to bring her to Nepal, I could carry her, but I don't want her just to be a passenger. She wouldn't enjoy the experience as much. Maybe to us, it felt like training, but to her, it is also fun. I don't really see myself as a coach pushing her to her limits each time, but as a guide to make sure her fun is safe. We are not just tracking. She is also looking at flowers. 
chasing sheep in the plains, and even observing the different textures on the ground. So at three years old, four months, little child flew to Kamandu, the capital of Nepal. She was about 85 cm and weighed 13 kilos. And for this experience, she would hike up to hikes around 4,000 meters in a world that is completely different from where she is. Little child is a city girl. And the first thing she noticed is the abundance of wildlife. Soon enough, she's able to tell apart between water buffaloes, mules, yaks, and zopkios, which is a very beautiful crossbreed between a cow and a yak. Very often, she would imagine animals to be in animal books, but over here, they are just right there. So while me and my wife marvel at all the mountains above us and looking at the scenery, little child was keeping her gaze fixed onto the ground, and her imagination went wow. One of the things that truly fascinated her was the color and shape of dung. She would ask Kami, my Sherpa, where did this animal come from? Where did this dung come from? And she would dodge and be marveled at the sight of it because they look like seashells. On the second day, I let my family down. Even though this is a route I have traversed a few times, I took a wrong fork and we ended up walking more than 12 hours that day. We became totally exhausted. Little child remained positive. And looking back, I realized that when we found out where we got lost, we still felt very calm. And I think this has a mirror effect onto our children because if we were to feel anxious with a lot of anxiety, it will reflect the same for her. Getting lost and making mistakes for her felt part and parcel of life. As we gain higher in altitude, the scenery changes, and from there we also started seeing yaks majestic creatures with very long hair that only exist up higher in the altitudes. Suddenly, we have one baby yak jump in front of us, followed by two other baby yaks. A yak herder saw us and immediately saw little child and asked, do you want to feed the baby yaks? And she did. Both animals and little child were totally charmed by each other. We reach an altitude of 4,000 meters, which is where the village of Kami, my Sherpa, lived in Pangboche in Sulukumbu Valley. At that point, we felt that we could have gone on to Everest Base Camp and take us about two days, but I felt that would serve my ego more than little child's satisfaction. At that point, feeding the baby yaks was already her highlight for the trip. And as we progress up in the altitude, this is where most humans start getting severe reaction to it as well. She adapted very well to the altitude during this whole journey. And one of the indicators is how well she eats at every meal. Generally, when you start losing your appetite, that's when AMS starts setting in. People often ask me, how did I feel standing on top of Mount Everest? It is not overwhelming happiness or a sense of excitement when I stood up there. I spent a total of 30 minutes looking around. The emotion that swept me that moment was relief. I spent three years, six days a week, training and being part of this journey. In the end, it wasn't my sheer ability and my mental strength to get to the top. It was also the fact that other factors beyond my control were in place. My teammates, my shippers, were in good condition that day. My climbing equipment, including my face mask, oxygen tank, down suit, crampons, were all working fine. And the weather that day was perfect. In order to dream an impossible dream, I knew I was able to perform at the highest of my ability. And then for the rest of it, for luck to follow. I felt relief learning this life lesson, standing on top of the world. As I bring my toddlers around travels, I often get a common question, will they remember? My reply to them is, does it matter? 
traveling with them, seeing different stratas of life, have already changed their behaviors, their attitudes, and their adaptability to situations. And most of all, I also wanted to show her that the world can be rather unequal. When we are in Nepal, we notice that a lot of the Nepalese are very generous, warm people. But I also pointed out to her that a lot of them are poorer than us because we can fly, go to their country and see and observe how they live. But it's hard for them to do the same, to come over to our countries. It's not a matter of who's better, who's worse, but rather, money does not equate happiness. I also brought little Chao to Japan, to Hiroshima, the site of the atomic bombing. And from there, it is a very complicated conversation surrounding war and innocent lives. And with her own perspective, she understood how complicated the world was. We were traveling in Hamburg, Germany, when she asked me a question that stumped me. She asked, why is it that the doors in the trains open only when you press a button? I asked my friend, and she explained that because in Hamburg, it's not as populated. So in winter, not all the cold air will rush in. So I told her the answer, and then she said, well, in that case, why is it in Japan all the doors open together? It occurred to me that she started observing details and observations that I wasn't pointing out to her. Through my travels, I wasn't designing a child with a fixed personality, but raising a child with her own interests and her own observations. As my toddlers go around traveling, we have interacted with musicians, construction workers, business people, and so on. The society may divide them, but we also find that their goals and aspirations are the same. As such, we are all equal, as what Little Chow concluded as well. Some of us would like to breed winners in a hierarchical world. But for me, the journey is far more interesting and meaningful. Little Chow may not become smarter or wiser through her travels, but our hope is that by showing her an unvarnished portion of the world, we will put in more empathy and understanding, and perhaps she can be a more useful citizen of tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> hello, say hello everyone. Hello. So you, you didn't know. Here we go. <laughs> do, do, do you like Guangzhou? Do you like Guangzhou? Yeah. Okay. I'll you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's all I want to ask. Uh, no, I want to ask okay. Stefan a question. Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes. So people might say they don't have the resources or have time to travel with their kids, mm. right? Yes. Um, what would you respond to um, this? Yeah. I also didn't think that I have the resources and, and, and the time. And I realized that I think one of the most pressure co uh, precious commodity, at least for this audience, is time. And I realized you don't have to take a long trip, but even a trip as long as two days or three days, being away from the city or the home where you stay, I think it's actually good enough because it brings you out of that comfort zone. And I think it really allows a lot stronger communication between parent and child. Right. Thank you. <laughs>